Today, my guest is Professor Joel Pedro de Magalhães. He is the chair of Molecular Biogenetology of Institute of Inflammation and Aging of University of Birmingham, as well as an expert in cryonics. Welcome to our broadcasting room, Professor de Magalhães. Our audiences cannot wait to listen to your share. Could you please make a brief self-introduction? Uh, yes, sure. So, uh, so pleasure to be here, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, so, I'm a I'm a cell biologist by training. Um, so, I'm originally from Portugal, uh, and then I did my PhD in Belgium on uh, cellular senescence and 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 cellular aging and stress. Um, then uh, I did a, a postdoc at Harvard Medical School uh, with George Church on genomic approaches and computational high throughput approaches to study aging. Uh, and then I established my lab at the uh, University of Liverpool on genomic approaches to aging. And last year I moved to Birmingham where, uh, as you said, I'm now chair of molecular biogerontology. And so my lab at University of Birmingham, we studied the, the process of aging, why we age and um, how we can develop interventions to, to slow down the aging process. Um, so, uh, so that's the main focus of my work. Um, I'm also interested in cryobiology, um, have an interest in cryonics as well. Uh, it's something we've done a little bit of work, although the main focus of our work is in, uh, is in aging research. Uh, I also work with um, several companies. I'm CSO of a company called Youth Bio that aims to develop uh, gene therapies based on partial reprogramming. Um, and well, I, th I think more related to, <laughs> to the topic today, I'm also founder of a company called Oxford Cryotechnology um, that studies uh, cryobiology, although we, we just started a couple of months ago, so it's still early days for them. Thank you, Professor Pedro, how rich and interesting your experiences are. Now, let's dive into the question. If you're okay with that, okay? Yes, of course. Well, um, first question is a little bit general that What's the deal with cryonics or cryopreservation? And what's the relationship and differences between its two words? Can you explain it to our audiences? Uh, sure. Well, cryopreservation is a very broad term about preservation of biological materials at, at, at low temperatures. That's, that's, that's the concept of uh, cryopreservation. It can be applied to, to cells. It can be applied to tissues. It can be applied to small organs so far so so it's it's typically small tissues and, and and cells that can be cryopreserved so that's that's broadly speaking that's cryopreservation the idea behind cryonic is declared illegally dead they're also cryopreserved no, uh, while cryonics is about applying cryopreservation to a whole human being um which i mean may or may not work in the future and, and what are the practical applications of cryobiology that are already being used today? So there's a lot of applications. So, so this inability of cells to, to replicate um, after about 50 population doublings. Eventually they become senescent. And this was discovered in a type of embryonic cell um, embryonic fibroblasts uh, called WI38 um, by a man called Leonard Hayflick, who cryopreserved these cells in the 60s, you know, so so over 60 years ago. And the cells that he studied in the 60s, they're cryopreserved. And, you know, you can thaw them and you can still use them. So that's one application in biomedical research. We have cells that, uh, you know, we can cryopreserve and then come back to them and study them in the future, share them with other labs and so on. So it's, it's very widely used for research cryopreservation. I mean, it's also used in reproductive medicine. Um, IVF, for example. I mean, there are people alive now that, that were frozen as embryos for, for years in some cases, uh, and then they were thawed and then they were implanted. Um, and now they're perfectly normal individuals, even though they were actually cryopreserved for sometimes years during their early life. Um, so there's a lot of applications. Um, now, I, I suppose in terms of regenerative medicine as well, there's also application in terms of cryopreserving small tissues, cryopreserving um, biomaterials, uh, cryopreserving stem cells. So there's a lot of applications um, in terms of 
small cells, um, sorry, small tissues and cells already. Um, the problem, I, I should say, is that it's a problem of size. So once, you know, you can cryopreserve cells and you can cryopreserve small tissues, but larger tissues take longer. You know, the temperature just takes longer to, to drop. Uh, and so you cannot safely cryopreserve a human liver or a human heart or, you know, any large human organ, you cannot cryopreserve it. So, so and is, that, that's, is that's a, a big problem. Is it a major challenge that we face in the cryopreservation technology now? Absolutely, uh, because one of the problems we have in, uh, in, in, in medicine is lack of organs for transplants. I mean, there's lots of people that need organs for transplants. Um, the problem is that when there is a, a, when, when someone uh, dies in an accident, for example, and they're a, a, an organ donor, um, they you know those organs will cannot be retained in some cases you know they 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 can have a viability for 24 hours or 48 hours and so you have that amount of time to find a suitable donor and then ship the the organs across the country to that person uh, and so there's a lot of wastage of organs because of that inability to cryopreserve human organs uh, so if, if we could safely cryopreserve organs you know like hearts liver lungs uh, kidneys and so on if we could safely cryopreserve them this would save thousands of lives each year um, because we could it, it would make the whole process much more efficient um, and would result in these patients that are dying because they don't have a suitable organ that they would be able to 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 be rescued. Then, according to solve this problem, um, what kind of efforts that we have paid, or do we have any solutions? So we do know. Uh, so it is possible to cryopreserve, let's say, small tissues and cells. So to do this. Um, so one problem that happens is that if you lower the temperature uh, below zero, you know, water freezes, right? And we're mostly water. Um, so one big problem is that once water freezes, it creates crystals. You have ice crystals. And ice crystals are very, I mean, they're sharp, essentially, and they will damage the cells and the organs. Um, so, I mean, decades ago, um, we discovered, scientists discover uh, it, cryoprotectants or antifreeze basically. So these are essentially substance like glycerol and ethylene glycol and the MSO that prevent ice formation. So and that's so when you cryopreserve cells, for example, that's what you do. You replace some of the water with uh, um, with an antifreeze. And same for small tissues and structures. So so you use these cryoprotectants. The problem is that the cryoprotectants also have some toxicity. So they're low toxic that's why you use them, but they, you know, at certain concentrations, they start to become more toxic. Um, so, you know, we have some methods to cryopreserve biological structures, but they're still limited. And so what we and others are trying to do is try to overcome that, develop new cryoprotectants, um, develop new formulations that minimize toxicity um, and so on. So there's a lot of efforts in that area um, in terms of better cryopreserving um, organs ultimately that that's that that's the goal we cannot figure out what is the differences between vitrification itself and the traditional freezing technology then could you please um explain it to our audiences about that uh sure so there's there's so there's different methods for cryopreservation as you mentioned um, I mean, there's something called flash freezing, which can be used for cells, where you essentially take cells and you put them in liquid nitrogen. Um, so, you know, ultra low temperatures, um, you know, and they freeze very rapidly. Um, so that's one method. So you, you, you have methods of very fast um, freezing. Um, and then you have vitrification. Vitrification is a particular uh, method where you have very high concentrations of um, of cryoprotectants. And so because you have very high concentration, you have this viscous solution that never really becomes solid. It becomes like this glass-like structure. So, so uh, uh, but the advantage is that it minimizes ice formation. As I said, ice, you know, is very sharp and can damage. So with vitrification, you don't have ice. Well, if it's done properly, you don't have ice formation. Um, and so, so vitrification is essentially a, a, a process of slow um, freezing, but with uh, with very high concentrations 
of of cryoprotectants, um, and then that you 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 get this, you know, this process where it's not really freezing. It's it's this it's called this glass like structure. Um, so so vitrification actually means turn to ice. Um, so so in vitrification, that's the preferred process. In cryonics, uh, the the companies and 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 uh, institutions that do cryonics, they use vitrification. During cryonics, what kind of damage can happen? And the second part of the question is, is there any way to repair it later on? All right. So, so in terms of damage, you, you have a lot of damage during cryonics. I, I mean, there are no studies. There are no published studies because cryonics is a very fringe practice. I mean, it's not, it's not really... Um, uh, an established academic scientific approach. So we don't really actually know how much damage occurs in cryonics. There's no, at, at least there's no published studies. Um, but we can extrapolate because we can try to cryopreserve organs and see the kind of damage that occurs. And you know, if you're cryopreserving a whole human being or even a whole organ, um, you have damage. You have damage because sometimes it's not possible to um, uh, infuse the um, cryoprotectant across the whole organ. And so you have some ice formation. So you can have ice formation that causes damage. Um, the cryoprotectants themselves, as I said, um, the, uh, because it's high concentrations, they cause some damage. So that's toxicity from the cryoprotectants. Um, so you do have um, ice, you have cryoprotectant toxicity at very low temperatures as well. Sometimes in organs, you can have um, fractures. Uh, because of differences in temperature. Um, so we know that there is substantial damage, even in organs, and presumably in cryonics, there's going to be a lot of damage as well. There's going to be yeah, cellular, molecular, even organ level damage. Now you ask, okay, but can we repair it? I mean, that's that's the hypothesis of, of the people who sign up for cryonics. So the hypothesis is that, you know, in the future, 500 years from now, maybe, we don't know. <laughs> but, but, you know, there's going to be technologies that are not available today. I mean, 200 years ago, we didn't have airplanes or mobile phones or the ability to talk on Zoom from someone in China, someone in, in the UK. So there has been huge technological process uh, advances in the past 100 years, right? So the hypothesis is that, okay, 500 years from now, from now, God knows what's going to be possible. It might be possible to repair damage that today we have no idea how to repair it. Um, and so people speculate that technologies like nanotechnology will allow repair of damage, um, including molecular and cellular damage to, to, to organs and, and patients cryopreserved that is not possible today. Um, now, of course, we don't know what's going to be possible or impossible in the future, um, but it, it, that that is the uh, the argument for trying cryonics because you have nothing to lose and uh, if the technology advances sufficiently in the future and presumably you know by then aging will be cured so you won't have aging or or uh, diseases um, and it will also be possible to repair the bodies of those that are being cryopreserved now. Then um, I'm curious about that. Will the patients? still have their memories intact when they're awake? So that's a very good question. I mean, it, it is speculation at this point. Um, I mean, what we do know about memories is that, first of all, there's short-term and long-term memory. So we do have some evidence or we do have some data from um, you know, people who suffer accidents, for example, traumatic accidents. So quite frequently, they lose short-term memories. Um, so they don't remember the accident or they don't remember what happened that day or, you know, so so that's quite frequent in terms of uh, individuals who suffer accidents. Um, so it is tempting to speculate. And of course, this is all speculation that if someone were to be revived in the future, they would at least have um, short term memory loss. So the, the, the memory of what happened when they died wouldn't be there. Um, in terms of long-term memories, you know, uh, memories of your childhood, for example, memories, um, we don't know. That's, I, I think, what the, the, the advocates of cryonics would argue is that if technology advances sufficiently in the future to repair the damage you see 
uh, from cryoprotectants, from ice formation, and so on, then you would be able to at least preserve long-term memories. So, you know, he would know your name, he would know, you know, where you were born, and so on, so you would have your memories from, uh, um, except the short-term memory. So you wouldn't have memories of what happened the day you died, or, you know, the, the, maybe I say a day, maybe a week you died, but you'd have memories for, and you would know who you were and you would have your personality and you'd have your um, emotions and you'd have um, what makes you, you. So that's, that's the hypothesis. But of course, we don't know. It is possible as well um, that, at least for some individuals, the amount of damage that they've endured during the cryopreservation process is so big that, you know, it's, it's, it's not, I mean, either not viable to revive them um, or they will have, um, you know, a, a lot of memory loss and a, a lot of personality loss. So I think at the moment it's still speculation exactly what what may happen. But I would say there is a possibility that individuals will be revived and at least their long-term memories will be preserved. I'm right agree with you on that since that there are many of our followers are uh, discussing about this technology and they say if people have no memory at all um, no matter it is short-term memory or long-term memory will he still be himself well it is mm -hmm. well up to a philosophical question yes no absolutely and that's <laughs> that that's what we want to preserve so we want to at least preserve long-term memories and elements of the personality of the individual, you know, their moral values, their, um, you know, the the their their motivations, you know, what makes you you. So I, I think most people would be okay with a loss of short term memories. I think, as I said, that happens already in, in uh, people undergo accidents and so on. Um, but it's the long term memories and the the part of your personality about who you are as a person of your consciousness that you want to preserve. Then, um, then, in your hope or um, in your speculation, what are the chances of actually being revived successfully from the cryonics for the patients? Or are the yes, possibilities? No, that, that, <laughs> no, that's that's a great question, and that's a great a question a lot of people discuss. Um, I think it's quite low, actually. I mean, I I I, I mean, it has I I think the possibilities are low. The chances are low. I mean, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. So it's a possibility to go right, but there's a lot of things that can go wrong. I mean, we can have a nuclear war tomorrow and we all die, right? So, I mean, that is a possibility. Um, so uh, maybe technology doesn't advance sufficiently. Um, maybe there's some intrinsic damage to at least some patients. Uh, because there's also different levels of quality in terms of cryopreservation. So, you know, I think some patients have so much ice formation and damage that it will be difficult, um, even with, you know, uh, amazing future technologies to to revive them. Um, so I would say the, tech, the, the chances are low. Uh, I mean, less than 50%. The, the, the point is that, you know, even if the chances are low, you know, if you have a, you know, if you have a, a cancer, for example, and someone tells you, look, I have a, a treatment that has a 10% chance of working for your cancer. I mean, 90%, 90% of the cases, you're going to die. But there's a 10% chance it's going to work. I mean, you take it, right? You, you know, yeah. you go, okay, well, I mean, 10%, it's better than nothing. I'll take it. So that's the argument as well. Um, now, some people, I think some cryonics advocates say that the chances are higher, maybe 50%. I don't agree with that. I think the chances are quite low. Um, but even if the chances are low, even if it's one percent, um, again, you, you know, you, if you have the the resources, uh, and cryonics is expensive, so um, uh, I mean, if you know, you take that chance to to just like if you had a cancer and you had a, a treatment with ten percent chance of of working, you would take it. <laughs> so, so that that's yeah. that's the argument. Even though the hope is frail, it's still worth our, our efforts, right? Yes, exactly. You know, you try. I mean, you've, you've, uh, you know, you, you, you try to do what's, even if it's a low chance of success, you, you know, you, you aim for the best outcome. That's, that's what you have to do. Um, and like I said, if you have a 
a terminal condition, but you have a, a small chance of a treatment, of a cure, you take it. I mean, that, that, that's what you do. Um, so cryonics is not very different from that regard, which is, I, I would say, it's, I say it's a low chance of success, um, but there's a high reward because if it works, you're not going to die. You're going to see the future. Um, I mean, I'm personally fascinated about the future. I love to see how the world looks like 500 years from now or a thousand years from now. So, so I'm quite fascinated by it. Um, and I'm quite frustrated at how short human lifetime span is. And that's why I work on aging, because I would like to extend the human lifespan, because I think it's frustratingly short, the human lifespan. Um, so, so that's the gamble of cryonic, so to speak, is that, yeah. yes, there's a low chance of success, but that has a huge potential payoff. And recent advances or progress that made in this field that maybe cheer us up. So there has been some uh, some progress. Um, there has been some um, some studies, um, mostly in animal models. So so the problem is, as I said before, you know we can cryopreserve small small tissues and cells, but bigger organs are quite complicated. Um, but there has been advances. I mean, there was a recent. I mean, cryobiology was on the cover of Science magazine just just two weeks ago. <laughs> so uh, so there has been advances, for example, in um, rewarming. Of, of tissues. So one of the problems of cryopreservation is the freezing, but also the rewarming afterwards, because you have to do it homogeneous. So, um, so there's been methods, for example, using nanoparticles. Um, I think these iron uh, nanoparticles that then can be um, perfused in, in an organ, um, and then you, um, you heat them up basically with uh, you know, uh, uh, electromagnetic um, radiation. So, and that provides a more homo homogeneous warming um, of the tissue, uh, sorry, of the organ. Um, so there has been advances in that. Um, there have been advances in terms of perfusion as well of the organs. Um, so, so there's been, um, you know, I, I would say this is still very preclinical, so to speak. You know, a lot of it is, you know, it's in, it's in, it's in, uh, um, you know, in animal models or in small tissues, um, but there has been um, uh, uh, advances uh, in, um, in in cryopreserving, um, you know, at least animal organs. So there's been a recent study in um, there's been a recent study in kidneys as well, um, cryopreserving kidneys in. It was either mice or rats. It was rodents um, in cryopreserving kidneys, uh, which was done successfully. So, of, of, though of course a rodent kidney is smaller than a human kidney, so and that's that's still a challenge. Um, so there has been yes, there, there has been. I would say there has been small advances in recent years in in cryobiology. Um, I would also emphasize that the field of cryobiology is quite small. I mean, not even not just cryonics, but cryobiology in general, cryopreserving organs, um, it's quite a small field, um, certainly compared to others like, like cancer or Alzheimer's, it's quite a small field. So, um, so I think advances, there has been advances, but I would say it is not as fast as, as, as I would like them. And that, that's, you know, that's one of the reasons we started this company, Oxford Cryotechnology, to see if we can advance the field faster, um, particularly for organs. And uh, cryonically frozen brain and uploading our consciousness to the cloud, uh, which means um, this is a concept Elon Musk seems to be embraced. I mean, the latter one. Um, so, so you mean mind uploading? Yes, mind uploading. So, yeah, so that's a, I mean, that's a, first of all, it's a theoretical concept. Um, there's no, I mean, there's no practical evidence it's possible, but uh, but it's a, it's a theoretical concept that you may be able to upload or copy your mind, you may be able to to scan your brain, um, you know, the neurons, the synapses in such a way that allows you to recreate your brain in a computer, and so your your mind, your uh, you know, your, your consciousness would be able to live in a computer as opposed to your body. Um, so I think it's quite, I mean, I, I, I love science fiction. <laughs> and as I said, I love the future and future technology. So I, I, I think it's quite a fascinating concept. Um, 
I mean, we don't know if that's possible. Um, you know, it's a theoretical concept. We don't know if it's possible to to recreate the human uh, consciousness and human mind in a computer. Um, maybe it is possible. Um, I would say, I mean, you know, even if you can do that, I mean, even if you can copy my mind to a computer, that's still not me. I mean, that's uh, okay. It's, it's, it's almost like having a clone. I mean, you can take my DNA, you can create a clone of me. Well, yes, that's uh, that's a clone of me. That's that's someone that looks exactly like me, but that's not me. I mean, <laughs> yeah. you know, if you smack my arm, my arm is going to hurt, not not the clone. Right. So so it's not the same person as me. It's a different person. So um, I, I, I don't think that's in terms of, um, you know, a, a, let's say let's consider it a, a, a treatment for terminal patients. I don't think that's an option. I don't think creating a clone of me is going to if I have cancer tomorrow, creating a clone of me is going to cure my cancer. It's going to create a clone of me, but I'm still going to die of cancer. Right. Um, yeah. Same with mind uploading. Um, if the technology one day um, becomes available, that's still not a, a cure for terminal conditions. That's creating a copy of you, which is still not you. It's someone else. Um, so, so, so to me, that's I think that's a fascinating technology, but I don't think it addresses the issue of um, of terminal conditions, for example, of you know being able to uh, to to sheet death, for example, which is which is an extending human lifespan, which is what I want to do. Um... Um, do you think that the success of cryonics one day will raise any social or ethical questions? Absolutely. I think it would be absolutely. So if we could cryopreserve individuals safely um, and, you know, revive them in the future, again, safely, um, then this would completely change medical, critical care, um, uh, interventions, right? Because if a patient has cancer or Alzheimer's, um, so if they have, or, or even certain cardiovascular diseases, provided you have enough time, um, you know, you'll be able to cryopreserve a patient uh, for the future. Uh, I mean, and that's something that's happened already. They have, I mean, for example, there are several children now that are cryopreserved. Um, again, whether they works or not, we don't know. But if we knew it was going to work, uh, if we knew it was safe, then if you have a, a child with um, with a terminal condition, like you know um, some famous cases of a, a young woman who had brain a brain tumor and was cryopreserved, um, then you know that that would be the option for critical care. And you know terminal patients would essentially be cryopreserved. So it would completely change uh, modern medicine um, because you'd have these cryopreserved patients for the future um, for them to to be cryopreserved until a, a cure for that diseases were developed. Um, I mean, and that raises a lot of social economic, I mean, it, it would completely change society. <laughs> you know, I, I think it would be a really a radical change. Um, I would say it would be uh, a tremendous advance in terms of uh, providing um, not a cure, but an intervention that allows someone not to die from their condition, which I would think would be fantastic, but it would create problems as well because you'd have these lots of individuals that would be cryopreserved. Um, so, so absolutely, it raises all sorts of, 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 of questions and, um, uh, and you would completely change society and modern medicine. So can we say that it is a both charming and dangerous or risky tech? technology? Well, let, let me put it this way. Um, we have a problem nowadays in the world with um, age-related diseases, like Alzheimer's disease would be an example. I mean, Alzheimer's disease is a horrible disease. Um, and the incidence of Alzheimer's disease has been increasing. It, it, it was fairly low 100 years ago, and it's been increasing. And it will continue to increase in the next 50 years. And why does that happen? Well, it happens because there's been other medical advances uh, that means in individuals, people are not dying young. So, you know, we had advances in terms of antibiotics uh, last century. That means 
you know, children didn't die from infectious diseases or died much, much less from infectious diseases. We've had advances uh, even in terms of tackling cardiovascular diseases with interventions like statins. So there's been a lot of medical advances. That means people are now living longer. Uh, and because they're living longer, they're developing Alzheimer's disease. Now, you can say, well, but that creates a problem of Alzheimer's disease. Yes, it creates a problem of Alzheimer's disease, but I think it's a good problem to have. I mean, I think that the goal of medicine is to make people uh, live as long as possible, as healthy as possible. That's the goal. Yeah. So if we can prevent people from dying of, um, of the influenza when they're five years old, that's fantastic. Um, maybe they will develop Alzheimer's when they're 90. But, you know, that's progress. You know, someone that didn't die when they were five mm -hmm. and they develop Alzheimer's when they're 90. That, that, that's progress. Yes, it creates a problem as well. It has a problem that now we have a huge and growing um, medical challenge of Alzheimer's disease. And there are neuro other neurodegenerative diseases. It's a problem. But it's a good problem to have, right? Because we have this problem because people didn't die when they were five. So it's a good problem to have. It's one of the miracles of technology and medicine is that now we have people with Alzheimer's that we did not 100 years ago uh, because there were medical advances. So the way I see it is same for, let's, let's call it human biostasis. You place individuals, um, you cry preserve them safely for future interventions. Yes, it would create challenges, just like curbing infant mortality created challenges. But I would say it's a good problem to have because it means that there was medical advances that prevented those individuals from dying earlier. Uh, and that is the goal of medicine, is to make people live as healthy as possible for as long as possible. Yes, so that all of the advances or the ther therapies which can save our lives are actually do more good than harm. Oh, absolutely. I, I think that's, that's, uh, that's again, that's, that's the goal of medicine, is to uh, make people live longer, healthier. You know that that that's what we want. Uh, we want people to be healthy. So if we have any new interventions, any new therapies, I mean, I get the question a lot about intervening in aging. Should we intervening in aging? Uh, yes, I mean, because if we intervene in aging, we prevent or retard Alzheimer's disease, and that's good. I mean, if someone instead of someone having Alzheimer's disease when they're eighty, they have it when they're ninety, that's progress. That that's good. Um, so. That's that's what we want to have. We want to have people healthier for longer. Um, so so absolutely, that's that's progress, and that's what we want. We want new therapies. We want medical interventions that uh, fight disease uh, and make people live longer and healthier. That's that's absolutely the goal. Quite clear. Now, listening to your share, uh, most of our followers uh, also have some questions about uh, tokens out. May I convey mm -hmm. their questions to you? Yes, of course. Well, um, first one is uh, a practical one. Many of our followers first learn about cryonics, these concepts, uh, actually through the case of Dora Kant and Elkhart Life Extension Foundation. And what are your thoughts or comments on that case? So uh, I think that there was a, so that was that was uh, so that that's that was the mother of Saul uh, yeah. Saul Kent, right? So that was yeah. that was something that happened quite a long time ago. Um, I have to say I'm not too familiar with the details. Um, my recollection, so actually Saul Kent, he passed away earlier this year. Um, he was a, a big advocate of of cryonics, um, but I think that the, if I remember correctly, he uh, he cryopreserved her. Um, and there was some controversy about what exactly happened, uh, whether there was some intervention to facilitate her cryopreservation, -preserv um, cryopreservation. Uh, and she was one of the first patients to be cryopreserved by Alcor, if I remember correctly. Um, so, so I don't know the details very well, but I I can understand the rationale for you know if you see. You know, if, if there's a loved one that whose health is deteriorating and you believe that cryopreservation would allow them to be um, revived in the future if the cryopreservation is done properly, how you want to do that sooner. I mean, there, so at the moment, for example, 
it's not possible to uh, to commit suicide prior to being cryopreserved, at least not not from a, 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 a cryonics perspective. So that that's not something that's uh, done. Um, so. Um, if you have a condition, Alzheimer's disease that we were talking earlier would be a good example. Um, I mean, if you have Alzheimer's disease and your brain is being destroyed, you might say, well, okay, but I, I want to be cryopreserved. I mean, I, I don't want to let, you know, this disease destroy my brain before it's, you know, before I'm gone, because then it will destroy my long-term memories. It will destroy my personalities, destroy who I am. So you might want to think, okay, so I want to be cryopreserved. Uh, even if I have to die sooner um, before the disease destroys me. Um, and I mean, that raises all sort of questions. And I, I think there's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a big can of worms in itself, but I can understand that rationale. And it is something that uh, I think in terms of the cryonics applications um, is not something that is still very well established. I mean, according to your opinion, if our brain structure has already been destroyed, Mm. Yes. Is there any uh, value uh, for us to still choose cryonics? So that's a good question. I, I, I would say if you're, so in theory, you may be able to regenerate and repair your brain in the future. I mean, even if you have a brain tumor, give, give brain tumor as an example, even if you have a tumor or Alzheimer's disease destroying your brain, um, in theory, may be possible in the future to repair at least some of the damage. But is that person still going to be you? I mean, you can imagine a scenario where you take cells from an individual, you create new neurons, <clears throat> you um, you repair the damage, but that will that person still be you? I'm not entirely sure. Um, I, I think it's quite a difficult question. I, I, I don't think I have a, a good answer to it, unfortunately. So, uh, but yeah, I, I would question whether... Um, you know, if 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 there is a lot of damage to the brain, if 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 you are no longer, you know, functioning, if you don't have your memories, if you don't have your personality, if you don't have have your values and motivations, then probably you're not you anymore. And in the future, people may be able to copy who you were, but they won't be able to uh, revive you the way you were. I mean, that that would be my take. But again. I, I don't claim to to have a, a definitive answer on the topic. I think it's quite a, quite a good question, but very subjective as well. Maybe there are still a way, a long way to go since that we can find the, the answer to this question. Now let's move on to the next one. It's also a practical question. Is that how much does cryonics cost these days? So there are a few uh, cryonics providers in the world. Um, I mean, the answer is it depends. So in Europe, there's only one company that offers cryopreservation, uh, which is uh, Tomorrow Biostasis. And I think it's 200,000 euros that costs. Um, Alcor, which is the biggest um, uh, cryonics company in the world. So Alcor has two uh, different um, so with Alcor, you can have a, a, a brain cryopreservation. In other words, they can remove your uh, head. Actually, it's a head cryopreservation because the head is the, you know, obviously the brain is the where your consciousness and your personality are located and your mind. So you can only have your head cryopreserved if you want, instead of having the whole body. Um, and I think it's cheaper cryopreserving the head. And next, uh, um, will you ever consider giving cryonics a shot for yourself or family down the road? Uh, kind of like sour cans. It, it is a quite personal question, I, I thought. Yes. No, I have. Uh, uh, so to be clear, I'm not signed up for cryonics, I should say. Um, I think part of it, well, I don't plan to die anytime soon, you know, so, I mean, knock on wood, um, but I'm not signed up for cryonics. I think there's still a lot of question marks about it. Um, and I'm not, I think the chances of success are low. And I mean, I'm not, so let me put this another way. If I were a billionaire, I would sign up for cryonics because mm. it's more about financial. I mean, I have, you know, I have little girls, you know, so at this moment I would, you know, if I were to die tomorrow, you know, my money would go for my daughters. Um, if I had a lot of money, 
if I were like a multimillionaire, uh, I would sign up for cryonics because in that circumstances, you know, it's just a financial cost of cryonics. That, that's the only thing. Um, and if financial costs were not a problem for me because I had a lot of money, um, then I would sign up. Um, absolutely. So, and maybe I will sign up in the future. We, we don't know what's, what would happen, you know, if I discover I have some terminal disease tomorrow. I, I, I don't know how, how would I react. Um, so I think it's quite a, I think it's quite a personal choice. Um, I mean, my wife died of cancer uh, some years ago, and, and, and she knew she was going to die. Um, and we talked about it, but we also thought he wouldn't, you know, the, the chance he wasn't particularly convinced that he would work. Um, uh, and so she was not cryopreserved. Um, again, I don't know how I would react. I would say, again, if, I, if money was not a factor, um, then I would, uh, I would sign up for cryonics, yes. I'm sorry for that. Uh, well, um, the biggest problem with cryonics at present is that um, it is it cannot freezing fast enough. The antifreeze used in cryonics may produce toxicity due mm -hmm. to uh, the temp temperature changes. So, what, what can we do to? Uh, Uh, prevent these kind of progress in research. So, so yeah, so you're right. So, uh, I mean, the, the issue is, I, I, I briefly mentioned already, it's an issue of size. You know, it takes a lot long, longer to lower the temperature of a big organ than a small organ. And so, you know, because it takes longer to lower the temperature, the cryoprotectants become more toxic, uh, which doesn't happen in cells or if it's a small tissue. Um, so, I mean, what, what, what we can do, there's a couple of things that we're trying to do. So as I mentioned, one of the things is trying to improve on the cryoprotectant formulations. So make them less toxic, make them um, more efficient, uh, more effective, and less toxic. So that's one of the things that, that we're trying to do, um, which would have applications. I, I should say, I, I mean, my research is not on cryonics per se. My research... What we're trying to do is on cryopreservation. And because, as I said earlier, if we could cryopreserve human organs, that would have tremendous applications. Um, so so uh, that's that's essential how we're trying to do things. And of course, if we could cryopreserve human organs, then that would have applications in cryonics as well. Um, but so, so what we're trying to do is trying to create new cryoprotectant formulations that are less toxic. So that's one of the things. Um, there's other um, other companies and other uh, labs. They're also trying to develop better ways of or faster cooling methods. So if you could lower the temperature faster, obviously that would have advantages. So faster cooling methods, methods that allow you to more rapidly perfuse and diffuse the the cryoprotectants. Um, so and 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 as well in terms of rewarming. Uh, later on. So so that's essentially the ways that we and others have been trying, which is lowering the cryoprotectant toxicity, um, speeding up the, the, the temperature or making the, the dropping temperature faster, uh, improving the perfusion. So that's, that's the methods that we and others have been uh, focusing on. We are looking forward to the advancement of this technology. And um, the last question may be, what, what do you think is the strongest or most promising anti-aging intervention or, or therapy or drugs or anything? Hmm, that's a, well, that's a very good question. I think, uh, I, I think it depends. I, <laughs> I'll give you two answers. I mean, because I think on one hand, it depends on what you mean by promising. I think, I think the, the, the intervention that is more likely to pan out in the near future would be pharmacological interventions, you know, like rapamycin and rapalox. So, so we know that in multiple animal models, rapamycin extends lifespan and there's ongoing trials in dogs. Um, so, you know, that that's, you know, the pharmacological intervention to me is the one that has the highest chance of success, you know, in the foreseeable future. And I'm quite optimistic about longevity drugs. Um, on the other hand, longevity drugs, you know, even rapamycin, they only extend lifespan by 10, 15%. So, you know, it is, okay, it would still be fantastic if we could do that to humans, um, but, you know, it, it, it's still not 
absolutely massive, right? So, so that's that's one thing. Um, that on the other hand, we have um, interventions like uh, reprogramming, cellular reprogramming, and rejuvenation. With um, well, so far with the Amanaka factors, that at least at the cell level um, appear to suggest cellular rejuvenation. So you can turn an old cell into a young cell. Um, and so that's in terms of promise, in terms of potential impact, I would say that's what has the greatest potential impact. And it's something we're working on as well, um, which is if you could rejuvenate your cells, then, you know, this would have tremendous impact. Of course, there's problems, you know, <laughs> you know, a lot of these cells that get rejuvenated, they could, um, you know, increase the risk of cancer. So there's still a lot of engineering and technical problems that need to be overcome. Um, so we need to, and we don't know if it's going to work in, in, um, in even in mice and, and much less in human beings. So there's still about a lot of open questions about cellular reprogramming and rejuvenation. Um, but in theory, that has a huge potential. So, so, I mean, those are my two answers, which is um, pharmacological interventions like rapamycin um, that I think, I think in the near future, we will um, we'll have longevity drugs and also uh, partial reprogramming and cellular rejuvenation, um, which, you know, still a lot of question marks about its efficiency, uh, whether it works and safety. Uh, but if we can get it to work, that would be, again, revolutionary because that would be reversing um, aging. Um, at, at, and at least at the cell level, um, that seems to be the case. Thank you for answering to these questions that uh, enlightened us a lot. But uh, though not willing to, our interview comes to an end. It is really appreciated that, that you accept our interview and share with us detailed and fruitful um, interpretation on these therapy or um, on this technology. And I hope that we will get close contact in the future and wish everything goes well with you. Well, thank you very much. Yes, it was my my pleasure. And uh, and yes, it's a fascinating topic and uh, <laughs> good luck for everything as well. And um, well, look look forward to future interactions. Thank you again. Now let's call it a day. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.